When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you could save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. Big deep breath. I'll tell you a joke about that one. Yeah, that's good. Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons there. Frank Steiner, who's in a bit of a melancholy mood this evening. Um, I thought I'd start with a little joke. We were talking just before we came on the air about taking a nice deep breath. Here's the joke for you. Um, young girl goes to the doctor and she's um, got a bit of cold or something. And he said, well, just, just you know, take, take your shirt off. And she takes her shirt off and he puts a stethoscope um, on her and says, uh, nice big breaths. And she says, yes, and I'm not even 16 yet. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's yeah. a golden oldie. <laughs> it's both sexist and makes for people with speech impediments, which I think is, uh, <laughs> feels to me. Hey, Stina, how are you this evening, my dear? Yeah, I don't know if you're, you know, you're, you're wording melancholy. I, I'm not sure if that's really accurate. It's just been a weird day. Um, but, no, I'm not in a bad mood or sad or anything like that. Um I don't know. I don't know. So it, it's it's been a, a, a maybe busy. I think I've been busier than normal. And um, normally I'm kind of relaxed and you know I don't really work too hard. So it's things have been kind of busy for me lately. And uh, I just I, I need. Yeah, it, it, it leaves you wound at the end of the day. I've found that yeah. I've been yeah. just the same between the, 
the kids going back to school and all mm. their active, various activities. I don't really get yeah. an evening now. I'm doing something yeah. or you know, watching the kids jump, jump off things or kick things around. Um, you know, and and then obviously with working all day as well, with, with concentrating. It, 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 <laughs> I, I'm right. shattered by the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the school thing, my son is 12 now. He's in the seventh grade. It's seventh, right? Yeah, he's in the seventh grade, and um, you know, he still needs my help with homework. And and you know, well, I think it's great that he's coming to me for these things. Part of me is like, you're 12 years old. Go do your freaking homework yourself. I'm not in school anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, so. I, I, I mean, I, I help my seven-year-old daughter with, with hers. I usually I, I help with with chipping in fingers. You know, like, if there's anything that involves any numbers higher than ten, daddy's fingers. <laughs> I've got another ten now. Um, my, my my son. To be fair, my my job there is just to make sure he damn well does it. You know, right, <laughs> I don't help right, him with it. Yeah. Sure he does, he's quite capable of doing it. Whether he actually sits down and does it or not is it entirely. But then again, I remember what I was like. I was an absolute sod at that age. I remember in my. <laughs> I don't know how it translates. It's actually my, my second year of high school, um, which would actually be my, it was called fourth year back in England for some odd reason. Right. Um, and I think it harked back to the days when they had middle schools. But um, I remember having to do a whole semester's worth of history um, oh, in wow. one weekend. I just oh, my God. A whole, um, I, my parents found out because they went to a parents' evening and found out I hadn't handed a damn thing in for the whole term. <laughs> that is awful. That was a grim um, weekend, I, was, I have to say. Yeah, I was actually pretty good in school, but I, I was a I was a secret nerd. Like nobody knew. I I I would hide my book in my purse. You know, because it wasn't cool to be you know to to read. It wasn't cool at all. So I I was I definitely hid it. I hit it well too. Nobody knew. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether I was I was classed as a nerd. I was. I, they used to call me professor. I was. I, was, I guess one of the smart kids. My, my, I, to be, I, I was. I was never really picked on for it. I, I, I was. I used to hang around with a bunch of hard nuts as well. So I guess <laughs> uh, sort of. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I had best of both worlds. I, I was nerdy. Plus, hard enough not to get bullied for it. So um, I, I yeah, learned at a very early age. I teach my kids. Somebody picks on you, you 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 hit them, and you keep hitting them so they, so they stay down. And you know, yeah, they, oh they my then, goodness. Um, and, um, you know, it stands true today as it did then. So, and both my yeah. kids have that philosophy, and they they have actually they've carried it out on occasion, and they don't get picked on, which is fantastic. Yeah, which my, is great. my son. My son called um, from school last year, and he's like, the principal said I had to call you. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what did you do? And there, two boys were picking on him, and he wasn't going to take it. And he turned around and started hitting the one kid back and ended up sending them to the hospital. You know, and, and everybody was um, – every yeah, everybody got uh, kicked out. Or not kicked out. What did they get, expelled or something? I don't even know what it was. Yeah. And uh, I remember – talking to the principal and saying, what's going to happen to the, the bullies? You know, my kid was just defending himself. And the principal mm-hmm. was like, oh, I don't think they're going to be messing with him anymore. <laughs> and needless yeah, to say, well, they have yeah. not. So. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my boy had that last year. I mean, you know, he's 13. Um, and this kid, it, they said, the, the, the vice principal said, you know, we, we watched it back on the CCTV. Um, my boy did everything he could to get himself away. He just, the, the kid was just ribbing up, ripping on him, you know. And mm. my boy, he, was, he, mo- he got up and moved, got up and moved, got up and moved. This is in the cafeteria. And then the, the other kid literally pulled his glasses off his face and threw them uh, on the floor, which my boy wow. kicked the shit out of his ear. And he said he, even now, even now he, he will actively... The, the, the sad thing was they were both suspended for three days. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, yeah. uh, it, it's, I said it was a hate crime. You know, I said if 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 my boy was he, he was the the little the little kid in the wheelchair and the other kid tipped him out of the wheelchair, what would you do about? It? Oh, it's not the same. Yes, it is. You know, oh, wow. my son he inherited yeah. my eyesight, so without his glasses, he's helpless. And to do right. that, so I said, you know, the, 
the, the, to, be, uh, to be honest, the vice principal is a, really, a, a decent bloke. He actually, on the QT, he said, look, to be honest, you're good on him. He said, I, I, this is what I tell my kids. And his hands were tied. The hands are tied. You know, the, the, the state dictates the, any physical altercation, and they have mm-hmm. to suspend them. So, yeah, to be fair, my boy, was, he, yeah. he got three, day, three days off playing PlayStation, so he was well happy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pretty much mine too. Same so thing. I'm not, so. not going to punish you. you. You've done exactly what I've been telling you to do all these years. Good on you. So yeah, he, he got to eat junk food and play PlayStation for three days. Yeah, so pretty much. Yeah, that's. There you go. Anywho, anywho, we have uh, we have some fantastic guests on this evening. Uh, our first Thank guest, you. and I, I hope my Yorkshire accent works with his um, his surname is Greg <laughs> F. Gifune. Uh, who is going to be That's talking to us about his awesome novel, Babylon Terminal. And I get to play voiceover, man. I'm going to actually do the reading because, um, I don't know, <laughs> we'll have to ask Greg, maybe he doesn't want to. So hopefully uh, AT&T willing, Greg, he's there. Are you there, Greg? <laughs> I am. Hey, Dave, hi. how you doing, Steve? How you good? Hello. Are you having a good evening? I am not too bad. Not too bad. I've been enjoying listening to you too. <laughs> you know, we we could we could we could just blather on all night. You know, it's a good job. No, it's guests very on. good. <laughs> it, would be an hour, it would be just an hour of dullness. So, uh, <laughs> hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm now speaking for you, Xtina, because you you know you you do you do go on. Um, <laughs> so, what, what part of the country are you in, sir? I'm sorry. What part of the country? Where are you speaking to uh, us from? I'm in, uh, I'm in Massachusetts, actually. Uh, I live not far from uh, Cape Cod. Awesome. Awesome. How is the weather there? Is it, uh, you getting some decent weather? Uh, it's pretty awful, actually, the last few days. <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's very <laughs> rainy and uh, uh, sort of drab and, and really, really muggy. Very uh, uncomfortably yeah, we- warm. Had it humid, yeah. We've had we've had thunderstorms. I think pretty much every evening this past week, and I've got like you say, yeah. it leaves horribly humid, horribly humid. Yeah. I'm not used to yeah, humid weather. Terrible. From, you know, the temperature doesn't normally get beyond you know 65, so we don't get humid uh. in Yorkshire, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, but nice. No, it's great. I, I have to say, I, I I was reading the reading the tagline. Um, for Babylon Terminal, um, and I shall read it now. This is the world of dark. I should do my voiceover, man, shouldn't I? This is the world of darkness. <laughs> of endless night and doom dreams. This is the beginning and the end. This is Babylon Terminal. That is awesome. I want to read this. So tell us about it, Greg. Uh, it's actually it's a novel that had been in my head for a number of years, um, but I had I had started. I actually started writing it probably six or seven years ago, but um, it kept getting, it, it's kind of, it's very different from anything else I've done. So it, I kept sort of, it was on the back burner in a, in a sense. And so I kept sort of, it kept getting bumped because I had other contractual obligations and things that had to get done. And eventually I had some time to, to actually write it and, you know, really dedicate some time to it. And so I did. It's, um, it's basically it's a story about a lot of people have been a little bit confused as to what where it's taking place and what's happening. If you read the back cover copy, it tells you. Um, basically, it's about people who inhabit our dreams and the reality that they live in when they're not in our dreams, or as they put it, when they're not working. Um, mm-hmm. And their world is a very kind of uh, dark and you know nonsensical world that doesn't always add up. You know, much like dreams. Uh, and the novel itself is about uh, uh, there's a there's a kind of uh, for lack of a better term law enforcement uh, branch called dream catchers who their responsibility is to make sure that everybody stays within the city where they're supposed to be um, but there's a mythology that they're not sure if it's real or, or not that if you leave the city and you go through these wastelands into where nobody knows that there's uh, allegedly an ocean and on the other side of this ocean is this uh, what they call a promised land where you can transcend to become one of the living and the problem with that is is not everybody can if everybody runs then 
there's no one to inhabit the dreams. So the dream catchers are responsible for going after the people who run. And they've either got to bring them back or they've got to terminate them, depending on what the, the order is. And the novel's about a particular dream catcher who's a very by-the-book, very extraordinarily violent, uh, very sort of black and white, you know, by-the-numbers kind of dream catcher who uh, has a very good reputation, has been doing this for a long time, and never questions anything until the night that his wife runs. And so the novel essentially follows him trying to get to his wife and bring her back before the other people assigned to get her terminate her and it follows him through this sort of literal dreamscape um and that's that's essentially the, the plot wow uh, do you know that uh, sounds quite quite clive barker-ish is, is, is that an yeah, influence for you yeah. it's i'm sorry okay it sounds very very much very reminiscent of uh, early clive barker is, is that um oh, yeah yeah yeah, I think so in the sense that it's, it's a sort of alternate reality that's, you know, and it's really not, I, my stuff tends to be very surreal and I, I I tend to do very sort of existentialist kind of stuff, but it, it, this is, even for me, this is kind of out there, <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, yeah. but it was one that I really wanted to do and I, and I really had this need to, to get it out of me. So, and people seem to, it seems to be, the reaction so far has been pretty good. A lot of people don't necessarily understand the backstory of it, but it's – and there was kind of a, a debate with the publisher as to whether we should have included that, but, you know, not everybody reads that. So, it, you know, I wanted it to be somewhat clear, but I don't yeah. – I don't mm-hmm. – I'm kind of a stickler about not defining things in terms of what I do. It was one of the reasons I didn't want to do the reading. I don't mm-hmm. – uh, I don't do re- – I don't, I don't do readings. I never have. Um because I think there's a very different, uh, to me, it's just the written word and the spoken word are two very different experiences. And I think if someone else reads my work aloud, that's fine because that's their interpretation and their, how they're experiencing it. But if I do it to me, it's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, if you went to an art gallery and you, and you looked at a painting and you had the artist standing next to you explaining to you what you're supposed to feel <laughs> and how you're supposed uh, to interpret yeah. it and how you're supposed yeah. to look yes. at it. And, yeah. and, you know, I know I'm in the minority uh-huh. on this. I know everybody else, and I have nothing against anybody that does it. I'm not, you know, I'm not putting anybody else down. It's just for me personally, I'm just not comfortable doing it because I like it to be an experience for the reader individually, and that can be different from person to person, yeah. and, and it should be. Yeah, to- totally understand that. Which is probably one of the reasons I, I, I don't listen to audio books because I, I like to have my own voice as I'm yeah, reading. Yeah, no, I'm I mean, the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I don't. It's along those lines. Read. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which again, Sorry, I was going to say that one of my favorite series. Um, you know, I, I've read every book, and they're just amazing. And I had the audio book. Uh, somebody, I was actually gifted it, and um, I started to listen to it, and it's just, it's not the same because it's not, um, you know, I don't know. It's just like I, I want the. You're right. I do want the experience myself, and I think I have a a good enough imagination that I don't need, um, you know, to be kind of told what I'm reading or. or right. You know? Right. So, yeah, definitely. That's why a lot yeah. of times people will ask me about certain books. I mean, I've written a lot of books in this business for, you know. I mean, I've been a professional writer for full time for over 12 years. I've been in the business for close to 20 now. So I've been knocking around for a long time. But, you know, a lot of times people will ask me to explain certain things because I often will leave things sort of open for the reader to decide. And I won't do that either because I don't want to tell you what, what, what this should mean. I want because it may mean something to you in a way that wouldn't mean to somebody else. So yeah. it's better for you to just experience it, and whatever the hell you take from it, we'll see that you know there's no right or wrong. Whatever you take, that you're good. Yeah, no, totally, totally agree with that. You know, it's um, I guess it's like you know you, when you see a movie of your your favorite book, you see a movie adaptation, and it, it, to be fair right. for me, it never it never lives up to the book because right. you know very rarely, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
what you're seeing there is, is somebody else, like you said, is somebody else's interpretation, and right. sometimes it, it can it can spoil it for me if they're no, no, that, that's wrong, yeah. you know, that, that's not how that should be, because in your own brain when you're reading, um, you know, you, you, your brain does that, you know, you do exactly. it yourself. Right. So, um, and there's you know, something so very exactly. personal about reading too, and that's sort of lost them. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-audiobook. I have some of my stuff on my book. I don't want to trash <laughs> any of that or make anybody mad at me. That's what I'm not the wrong thing. But I think there's something very, what makes reading so special is that there's nothing quite like it. There's nothing really that you can, you know, it's sort of the, it was sort of the original interactive, you know, experience. And, and oh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a very personal experience. And I think that's the beauty of it. And I think if you, you know, like I say, I'm not saying other people that just for me personally, it just it's just not something I want to do. Yeah. No, totally agree. Totally agree. So I I I, yeah, I hope you're okay with reading this this excerpt then. <laughs> oh, I'm fine. I'm looking forward to you reading it. I enjoy when other people do it. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> oh, fine. If you rather I did, I didn't destroy it with my um, my foreign Yorkshire accent. <laughs> I think you'll, I think it'll make it better, no frankly. Way. I think. <laughs> I think it'll flap it off. I think you I think you're fine. Yeah, that's why okay. you, that's why that's why we call you James Stay it, Stay it again Longmore, you know. Well, I, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try to get more people, people to ask you to read. It. <laughs> <laughs> people don't I it's funny, I, I when in my earlier days when I got the I I did stand up on the, the Houston comedy circuit and I remember one end of one show, one guy came up to me and he said, You know, I can't understand Word you're saying, I couldn't listen to you talk all night. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether that was flattering or not, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, fair enough. Maybe obviously he's very easily amused, but um, whatever. Well, tell you what, okay, let, let's give this a go. I've been dying to read this bit out. It looks absolutely uh, uh, gripping. Um, so, are we ready? We're ready. Uh, this is, yeah, go for it. From Babylon Terminal. All my gods were dead, little more than smashed idols strewn across years, blurred by the very sins that had killed them. I was an assassin sent to murder myself, and I'd done my job well. The despair was unavoidable. There was no escaping it. I created my gods, or perhaps because of them. It no longer mattered. Their temples were in ruins, and nothing could ever rebuild them. Cradled in the death life essentially become a waiting game. Waiting for the next chapter, the next bit of news, the next town, the next person or whatever they might know or choose to tell me. Everything else existed on the periphery or as bridges between such things. Hours spent anticipating the next event. It was all about being there or getting there. And even though it was slowly obliterating me, nothing else mattered. Mine was a gradual apocalypse a slow burn creeping across a ravaged land, broken as my dreams and diseased as my memories. I packed a bag, left my studio apartment and headed out of the city. I didn't know if I'd ever return, but I wasn't about to miss that dingy, soulless little room anyway. Nothing good had happened there. Julie and I had lived there for a time, but in a city of darkness there was no peace in the flames, no salvation in the fire. And even when there was something akin to happiness... It arrived as a lie, a trickster dangling goodies before us only to snatch them away the moment we reached for them. It laughed at us, the night, and we laughed too, because there was nothing else to do. It had us in its position. What else was there to do but bleed? Sacrifices to gods long dead. That's all we were now, all we'd become. I want to read this. Sorry, that was the end. I want to read this. That's fantastic. See, that was that was terrific. You were that was. I enjoyed that. See? Hey, thank That's you. way better I than I would have done. I hope I did a much better it. experience than listening to me do it. You know. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that beautiful, beautiful. That was almost, almost poetry. That was beautiful prose. So I, I really thank enjoyed you. that. So is is Babylon Terminal? Is it it's available now? Yeah, we can we can buy that from it the is usual. Available now, yeah. Yeah, you can get it pretty much anywhere. Um, the uh, the there was a hardcover edition, but that's sold out. The um, but it's available in paperback. It's available in in uh, ebook. Uh, Amazon, you know, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much get it wherever you wherever you shop. Awesome, awesome. Now that's great. I, I 
And so, okay, you know, obviously mentioned Fly Bark. I mean, what, who are your, who are your primary um, influences when when with your writing? Um, you know, it's always hard to. It's funny because I have a very um, I have very sort of eclectic tastes when it comes to pretty much everything. You know, even people. I like diversity. I like <laughs> you know different yeah. things. So, um, I, I there were some people in the horror genre that I was sort of you know. I would say inspired me more, maybe more, um, but more, I think I was probably more inspired by, by crime fiction writers. Um, uh, Chandler, you know, um, Jim Thompson, definitely. Um, those kind of writers really inspired me. There were, there were some horror writers, but, but I, I think it was mostly, um, more sort of, uh, the surrealists and those type of writers really probably had more of an impact on me. I didn't, um, I, I never really set out to be, you know, quote unquote, a horror writer or, and I don't even really consider myself. I just, you know, I'm just a writer. I don't, whatever it is I do, whatever category people want to put that into is fine. Um, yeah. but mm-hmm. I, I, it's hard to do lists. It's kind of like when people say, well, who do you read and who do you like? And who do you, you know, you, you know, you don't want to leave anybody out and you don't want to forget anything. So I don't like to do lists, but, um, there were a lot of people. There, I mean, I was a voracious reader. I was. Um, my parents were both teachers, and I was very fortunate there because I was I was able to read before I went to school, um, and that was reading was sort of you know instilled in me very very young. Mm-hmm. So I've always been a voracious reader. I've always been. I always have you know a book going. Or I'm constantly reading, and since I was a little kid. So um, I'd, I'd say there's a pretty. I'm sure there's an enormous amount of influences that over the years. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, what always was for me was more about what moved me. If something moved me, if it, you know, I I tend to react more to emotional than, than, you know, just, you know, like people talk about story and I tend to react more to character and, Mm, and, 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 you know, know. yeah. I I definitely like the more character driven. Yeah, that's yeah. when people will say to me, well, do you, I don't usually, interestingly, I mean, sometimes I do and sometimes it depends on, you know, what we're talking about, but uh, many times I have written novels that began with characters, not plot. Mm. I had no idea what the hell the story was. The story yeah. was born out yeah. of the characters, you know, and so mm-hmm. um, that's more my, my kind, that's the kind of thing that turns me on about, I'm more into that, so. Yeah, I, I definitely have to connect with the character um it, it, if i a lot of times it is it very the story is very secondary to the characters and um if i can't you know connect to them i i have to see them you know i really do right. i've even gotten to at the point now where and this is so silly but i try to like dream cast them i'm like hmm this is you know i try to sound like an act <laughs> see you're laughing <laughs> but I, no, so I think it's awesome. It I think it ties into what we were talking about before. It's it, that's your yeah. that's the way you do it, and the way that yeah. everybody does it is the way they should do it. That's that's great. Yeah. That's yeah, what makes definitely. writing. Well, that's what makes reading great. I mean, that's what's that's what's so fun about it, and you I see, think ultimately and, rewarding. Yeah, the the project the the word in prog- um what I'm working on right now started out as a, a short story, and it was pretty much just a scene. And a character, it wasn't even, it really wasn't a story. There was no, like, beginning, no end. It was just just this one scene, and I've decided to expand upon it. Um, but when I decided this, I had no story in mind. I didn't. I just, mm-hmm. I had this flash of the girl standing out in the rain, and that was it. And I knew I had to keep going, but I didn't know where I was going. And I'm still not quite, I'm not 100% sure yet, but at least I have a direction. But it is very much more, uh, I guess, character driven than anything else, at the, especially at this point. So, well, I think we're in the process now. <laughs> well, now we're into off of reading in the process of writing, and I think you're right there too. I think that's also correct. Is that whenever I edit or if I'm, you know, trying to teach anybody or mentor anybody, I always say that there's, you know, the process. Whatever your process is, is, is what it what it is. You know, there's mm-hmm. there's too much yeah. of this right. Everything has to be right or wrong. It's, it's completely, you know, the opposite of what creation, any kind of creative endeavor should be. There's no rules. You, you, I mean, there's rules in terms of craft and, you know, you should right. learn, learn what you're doing and, and, and always be in a state of that. But 
beyond that, I mean, whatever your process is, whatever works for you, that's what you should do. That, that's that's what's yeah. you should that should be encouraged, not you know, there's this cookie cutter. It's like the people that say that <laughs> are constantly on these dens of you know how many words they wrote today. I don't care, you know, when I'm working with yeah. somebody like just as an editor, for example, I really don't care how many words you wrote today. I care how yeah. good those <laughs> words are. I don't care if you wrote three words. Are they good words? Then we're good. You know, I mean, it's yeah. So yeah. whatever I works basically... for you, works for you. I basically try to get a scene done, but no, I'm not. I'm not concerned with how many words either. But I am. I do want to at least complete this scene before I go on because if you, you know, for me, if I try to go back, um, like halfway through or something, it just kind of messes up the flow. So um, I right. did. Uh, it was funny. I was writing this one part, and again, I did not know what was coming next until I had that aha moment, and. Uh, when I had it, I, I was actually, I got a little overwhelmed because it was already late at night. I'm like, oh, man, it's going to take me forever to finish this scene. But it was good. It was good anyway. But it it was super late, so sometimes. <laughs> well, sometimes you have to, you got to get it done because you, I know what you mean. I, I, I do the same thing sometimes. You you just, you, you, you force yourself, you're like, I can't stop until I finish this, this one part or I'll yeah, never get yeah. it right, you know. I, I understand. Believe me. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on the show, Greg. You you, you were such a great guest, but our, it looks like our time is up. You know, it goes by way too fast. And um, but you have to promise to come back. Can I can I bother you again and then have I, come back? I I absolutely you? will. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was, <laughs> it was very nice. Yeah, I absolutely. Thank you. Thank you well, very much. If you, if you if you do, I, I promise to uh, <laughs> I promise to murder some more of your <laughs> some more of your work. <laughs> yeah. In, in yeah. Your I'm, 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 <laughs> yeah, I'll come back if, if you promise to read more of my of, of my stuff. Yeah. Hey, um, you 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 do it. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Greg. All right, thank you guys so much. Okay, Greg, thank you. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Uh, take care. And you. Bye bye. That that was that was awesome. What a, what a great guy, and I, I I did enjoy I did enjoy reading that. And, you know, pe- people people often say, you know, hey, hey, Jim and Xtina, where where can we buy your books? Um, and obviously, the, the the best place to look for that, obviously, we're on Amazon. Um, we're on uh, jadedbookspublishing.com, uh, which is where we sort of some of our books hang out. Mine on there is the Erotic Odyssey, Colton Forche, and Xtina's is Dark Musings, Sorry. which is some disturbing, wonderfully disturbing poetry, which. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. a, a damn fine read, I have to say. <laughs> um, lots Thank of you. great things happening with, with, with jaded books. Obviously, we've got new new authors. We've got new books coming up. Um, mm-hmm. A fantastic Halloween anthology that uh, we're both in, which is Dark Candy, mm-hmm. which is going to be a, a doorstop of a volume. Great value for money. So, uh, hope anybody listening to this or to the recording afterwards uh, will go out and buy it. Because uh, it all goes to a good cause, which is um, which is us. Um, obviously, you know, we can we can buy the kids shoes and feed them, which is something we need to do. Because we we write we have to guilt people. Yeah, we have to guilt people into it. You know, we we'll do that too. We're not above that. Well, no, I'm I have no pride. I mean, I, I put my left my pride behind when I decided to follow my my true path and be a writer. You know, back in the day, I I. I Worked in sales and marketing, and had the company cars and the pension, the fat salary, and that. And yeah, I was miserable as hell. To be honest with you, I'm actually enjoying uh-huh. what I'm doing, which is great, you know. So, um, so okay, we, we've we've done the plug. Uh, we have a, a, another fantastic guest um, lined up. But first, I think we're going to have a a little bit of a tune, um, if that's okay. And then we'll be right back after that. <laughs> Just too good to be true Can't take my eyes off you You'd be like heaven to touch I wanna hold you so much At long last love has arrived And I thank God I'm alive You're just too good to be true Can't take my eyes off Take my eyes. 
It seems to be uh, a bit of a Frankie vibe in the four seasons tonight. Which is, well, I, I was I was I was finding um, finding Ragdoll, and I, I love that tune. Um, but I'm a big fan. I think Andy Williams, I think, did it uh, a long, long time ago. And I actually heard heard that version for the first time on uh, an episode of the, the recent series of Girls. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the Lena Dunham series, and it was, it was actually the, the very last show, and it was the, the, the song they played out with. Uh, and at first, I thought, "Who, who is?" That? I thought it was a woman. <laughs> I didn't realize Frankie Valli had actually done that. I always associate it with Andy Williams, which um, just shows how old. I'm oh God! Uh, anyway, for food yeah. parcels, it's my birthday on Saturday, so um, anybody wants oh, to, to really? donate. Yes, it is. It is. So, and I, I'm, already, I'm getting happy birthday messages through LinkedIn, so I think maybe I have to, I'll actually put my birthday in wrong on LinkedIn. But um, thanks oh. for everybody on LinkedIn. Happy birthday. Um, yeah, I, I really am that bloody old. So. Aww. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I, I must have actually I'm, to get old. I'm still. I I ref, I'm refused mentally refusing to get out. I still mentally I think I'm yeah. not really progressed past twelve. Um, <laughs> but physically, you know, I I I I, I grow when I stand up and my 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 knee hurts a bit when I go up the stairs and I have a, you know this is just what is going on. What is going on here? You know, it's um, yeah. I, I think it's, mentally, you know, mentally, I'm I've gotten to be. I think I'm maybe seventeen. So you know. Um, and I, yeah. I'd like to stay there. I don't want to get too much older than that. I really don't. <laughs> it, it, it's I don't know at what age it happened, but you get to a certain age where it dawns on you. You know, you'd be thinking about stuff you did in the past, et cetera, et cetera. It dawns on you. You don't get to go do that again. Yeah. And yeah. it's just that, that stark realisation. There was something, whatever, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s, you know, and, yeah, well, you, you, you can almost find yourself, catch yourself thinking, I'll do that differently next time. Well, hang on a minute, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, you know, um, people are always talking about... Yeah. Mm. I just heard some are you still there? Mind. Yeah, yeah, I, think I, I am. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, we we have we've got our second guest coming up, which is, is I'm excited about, and I really again. I, I, I apologize, obviously, put it down to the accent. I hope I, I pronounce his, his, his name right. It's Ezekiel? Ezekiel. Right? I, I'm pretty sure it's Ezekiel. I'm just yeah, I, yeah, sorry. Um, that's a <laughs> Boone. I got that, Boone. Ezekiel. Mr. Boone. I'll call him Mr. Boone. And again, I do apologize if, I, if I've murdered his name. <laughs> uh, hopefully, he's not, he's not disappeared. In, on, in being no, offended. No. Um, you got, you got the last name right, so you got the last name right. So well done. <laughs> I was I think right, if you right? Got that wrong, I, I would be. Yes, I would be mortally wounded. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. Ezekiel. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> again, I do apologise if I murdered it. I, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> so, well, thank you for joining us. Um, you're here to, to, to chat to us about your, your book, The Hatching. Uh, how's this for a tagline? This is, this is awesome. So this has got everything. 
Hashing is like Jurassic Park meets The Walking Dead with hordes of flesh-eating spies. What else do you need? I mean, seriously, what else do you need in a book? Really? That is, I'm just going to buy it now for my, for my Kindle. I just want to read this. It sounds, I'm a big creature. Cre- creature story fan. In fact, my, 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 my own creature story, Peed, was um, published with um, Black Bed Sheet Books earlier this year. Um which was an homage, a homage to the creature genre. So, is 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 it a is it a, a pardon the pun? Is, is it a, a a a pet subject for you? <laughs> um, you know, I I I kind of wrote the book because I had the idea and then I couldn't shake it. I was having nightmares about spiders, and so uh, I thought it seemed like a, not a bad idea to just to write the book as a way to, to stop freaking out about it. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's funny. The, the problem, of course, is that everybody keeps sending me spider stories and videos and pictures and wanting to talk about spiders. And I keep having to point out that I'm actually very afraid of them. Um, so, a bit off. Oh, so you're a genuine arachnophobe, yeah? Well, spiders are, are scary. I mean, I don't... They are. They are. Yeah, I, I don't think it's arachnophobia. I think it's common sense. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, I, I definitely think it might be an irrational fear, but I, I'm I'm really terrified of them too. You know, I, I a friend of mine I was talking on the phone, and you know he said he it was a spider, and uh, no, yeah, and I, he he said, don't you want to know how big it is? Well, it doesn't matter how big it is. If it's small, if it's big, it does not matter. It's a fucking spider, and I'm scared of it. So. Seriously, what are you like? <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> You know, I must admit, it's, it's uh, m- moving to Texas where everything will kill you. Uh, for, I mean, back, back in England, we don't, we don't have many many things venomous. I mean, we have one venomous snake, which is the lamest venomous animal on the planet, which is a... a, 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 a which, they're cute, to be honest. Oh, um, whereas here, you, you have... Yeah, you've got spiders. You, you've got... It's funny enough, giant centipedes, the Texas giant centipedes. Which had I known, I would never have moved here. To be honest with you, because I, I, it's the <laughs> one thing I really, really hate. But um, yeah, so is, is you know spiders. Obviously, it's your thing. Have you written a lot about spiders? No, I mean this is the first. This is the first book I've written about spiders. It's the first book in a series. The second book, Skitter, comes out in May of seventeen. Um, but you know, in a lot of sense, you know, the funny thing I think most of these sort of creature feature books they're never really about the the creature themselves they're really sort of about the nature of fear um you know mm-hmm. Xena was uh, was saying that it's an irrational fear of spiders and in some ways she's right i mean like the the number of people who get killed by cows in the united states yeah. is significantly greater every year oh my god really? by spiders. <laughs> you can <laughs> in, in africa more people are killed by hippopotamus than snakes, than oh spiders, and there you go. So it's count. It's the it's the big herbivores you need to watch out for, not the spiders and stuff. You know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I could die of fright if there was a big giant spider. I think I could die of fright. So I I I don't agree with that. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to see hippopotamus any time. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I think the thing with spiders is they're so alien to the way they move and the way they look is so alien mm. to so many other creatures on earth that they, they, I think they trigger something sort of deep within us that sets that yeah. terror going that it, it, it's not rational. Um, and yet I'm still don't like being startled by a spider. No, no, my son. It dates back to our, our day, you know, caveman days, you know, obviously the, 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 the vision of a, a spider or a snake as well. I mean, again, when you think back in those days, being afraid of big spiders and snakes was actually um, a survival technique, you know? So it, it's ingrained, right. you know, that, that we, we are programmed to be frightened of these things, you know, and, and but not cows. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not cows. Killer cows, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a novel there for one of us. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll leave that one for you. I think I I'm going to the same. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, if anybody can pull it off, though, James, I, I believe that you could, so... I do. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's flattery or insulting, actually, to be honest with you. No, it was, 
That was total <laughs> flattery. It was. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, killer cows. Yeah, I'll um, I'll make a note of that. <laughs> I, that. Mm. I get 30%. <laughs> well, 30 percent. Well, 30 percent or a couple of good steaks. Yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Mr. Boone, I'm going to call you Mr. Boone. I'm sorry. He's a, he's a kill. Um, who, who are your influencers? I mean, is it the, the good old creature features, the old them and arachnophobia sort of movies, or? I think, you know, who I read is probably less important than who I read. Um, you know, I think for a lot of people who write, it, it's really the first books that you come to that are the ones that um, really influence you. And I think like a, yacht, a lot of people who, who, who are writers now, I grew up as a, you know, I was a really heavy reader. There's a time, you know, sort of middle school and high school where I was reading two books a day, um, oh, wow. which, you know, you can do when you don't have any responsibilities as an adult. Um, I was actually just talking to a friend of mine today that, you know, nobody tells you as a kid that being an adult seems to mostly actually be about doing chores. Uh, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I grew up and I, I, I read I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. And, you know, for me, I remember sort of the books I really loved when I was, you know, like a, a, a young teenager, a boy sort of turning into a young man, were really sort of like Isaac Asimov and Robert Heinlein, this sort of grand sort of space adventures. And And the thing that I really most remember about them uh, is that they were fun. Um, now, of course, going back to some of them, when I go back to some of them now, I have a little bit of hesitation. But, um, you know, I think I didn't set out to write a book about spiders. I set out to write sort of a big, fun, messy, sort of globe-trotting adventure. Um, and I didn't uh-huh. want to do sort of the traditional creature feature where it's just sort of, okay, there's one, you know, there's one really scary, you know, dinosaur there's one very scary whatever or there's, there's a giant spider that's going to eat you and I wanted to do something that was sort of more of an unstoppable menace and so the spiders in the novel are really just sort of hordes of tens of thousands of these spiders so it's not that the spider it's one it's not that one spider is scary although these ones probably are it's that there's thousands of these scary spiders yeah I'm scared I, I, I'm, I have to put the book in the freezer <laughs> it's the, the swarming um, thing. I mean, it's funny, mate. It's, it's probably a, a parallel with my my uh, Pete, which was about giant centipedes. Um, started off with um, one really, really big one in my head, and I thought, no, the, the, again, absolutely parallel. You know, the, eventually, I mean, I, I still have I still have the, the one giant one, but the scariest is, is the swarm of small ones. They're yeah. A bit bigger than yeah. And the fact that they swarm and they, they crawl all over you and in you and, and, and oh, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's just between one piranha fish and a whole shoal of the damn thing. One, not a problem, you know, uh, maybe bite your finger end, but a whole shoal of them will strip you down to the bone in 10 seconds, you know, whatever, you know. It's, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, something about when it's very primal when, when nature does it. It's like locusts. I mean, locusts won't hurt you. I mean, they're herbivores. However... Who wants to get stuck in a, a locust swarm? <laughs> it's just I've seen seen movies of those and mm. you know documentaries and, and they will just there's just there's literally billions of them, billions yeah. of them. And yeah. Just being caught in that must be a nightmare. You know, horrible, horrible, horrible. So anyway, um, you 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 you're going to do your own reading this evening, Mr. Boone. Yes. Yeah, I can. I'd be happy to read part from the novel if you'd like. Would you mind? That would be fantastic. If you could give us a short, short burst of, of, of that. That would be fantastic. Sure. The, 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 um, the airwaves are yours, sir. The airwaves are yours. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so this is a short piece, about 400 words from The Hatching, and it's uh, a couple chapters into the book. Um, Frantic, he ran the light on the wall and then the ceiling, then across Henderson's face and torso and down the burnt flesh and exposed bones of Henderson's leg. And there, relief, the spider on the ground. It was moving slowly. Mike knew it wasn't the right word for an eight-legged thing, but it looked as if the spider was limping. He squinted and leaned over. There was clearly something wrong with the bug. Two of its legs weren't moving, and it was dragging its body along the ground. Maybe it had been injured in the crash or gotten burned, too? Mike shook his head. Who cared what happened to the spider? The only question that mattered was, 
how the fuck had it got into Henderson's head? Except, Mike realized, as he watched the spider dragging his body across the floor. The question that was bothering him most was, why in all the angels of mercy was the spider coming toward him? Because it was absolutely headed toward him. It wasn't trying to get away or hide or even oblivious of Mike. It wasn't doing any of the things that to Mike in his limited experience of creepy crawlies seemed natural. No, it was clearly moving in his direction. Mike tried stepping to the side and the spider changed its line, angling toward him again. Mike took another step to the side and banged into the table that was next to Henderson's chair. And again, the spider changed its bearing. Mike started to reach for his gun, but he quickly realized that shooting a spider might be overkill. He started to psych himself up to just squash the thing with his foot. It might be big and hairy and incredibly creepy, what with the eating its way out of Henderson's face and then making a beeline for Mike. But it was still something he could stomp on when the spider stopped moving on a dark spot on the floor. It took Mike a second to understand what the spider was doing. The dark spot on the floor was blood. He looked at the suit jacket wrapped around his hand and saw a drop of blood fall to the floor. He had been bleeding on the floor. The dark spot on the floor was his blood. And as near as he could tell, the spider appeared to be feeding. Oh, you can't leave it there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I got the willies. No. no. <laughs> For somebody who's, who's trying to spy this, I that is very brave of you. <laughs> right? It is. <laughs> very, very well, brave. Well, you know, I, a lot of readers, you know, there are certainly a lot of readers who have been emailing to tell me that I had somebody email me um, last night that basically complained that I owed them three nights of sleep. Um, oh, nice. But uh, the funny thing is, I, you know, I think in a lot of ways, while the hatching is scary, I think it's really more than anything, it's fun. I mean, I think it's scary in the same way a roller coaster is, um, in that it's sort of mm-hmm. thrilling and moves quickly. But uh, you know, I don't know that it's just straight up horror the whole way through. Yeah. I've had. I hope. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so is, is horror your first love? I mean, is it or just something you sort of... I mean, I think I'm too much of a natural... I think I'm too afraid of things to have horror be my first love. I mean, the, the truth is that, you know, I particularly growing up when I had friends who'd want to watch horror movies, I, you know, I would always point out that, that they were scary. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah? You know, they, they, <laughs> yeah, and that, so there's a certain part. Like, I remember, I remember very clearly... Um, at one point watching, um, oh, hell, I think it was, it was, it might have just been called, you know, Ouija. It was about a Ouija board. Um, right. And yeah. it was just terrifying. And you know, <laughs> every other teenager in the room seemed okay watching this. Um, and same thing. I remember when I was, I think, 13 years old, at the end of the street I lived on, and I lived, I lived on a park and sort of across from our house, there's this little lake, and um, it was a very kind of, it was a big park and very dark, and, um, we'd actually bought the house there partially because there had been two different murders in the park in the past year, and so we got the house oh, really wow. cheaply. And, you know, at the end of the street, there was this girl who was a year older than me, and I thought she was really cute, and she had a bunch of her friends over who were all girls to watch Nightmare on Elm Street. And, you know, I didn't like horror movies, but, you know, like, <laughs> when you come watch a horror movie with me and my six or seven, you know, teenage girlfriends oh, um, oh, you know, wow. of course I said yes <laughs> right so I watch it and you know I finish watching the movie and it's about 11 30 at night and so I go to walk home and it's a block it's only a block I get halfway down the block and it's, it's very dark there's kind of this, this heavy fog coming over the lake um, drifting towards me and I get about halfway down the block and the street light that I'm directly under just goes and goes out <laughs> I ran oh my screaming all the rest of the way home, <laughs> sprinting, you know, awesome. and into the house, slamming the door behind me, locking it, you know, like panting, <laughs> looking out the window. It was, it was, anyway, so I feel like that's generally my experience of watching horror. I'm much happier <laughs> reading horror um, I can do because I can, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, as Christina has said, you, know, you can always throw the book in the freezer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because I, I love reading horror. I love watching horror movies, but I have to confess I'm a huge wuss. I really am. 
Um, really? You know, my, 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 yeah, my boyfriend doesn't understand why I like to uh, watch these horror movies and be scared because, you know, he, he doesn't like them. And he says things like, you know, um, he, he just doesn't understand if I'm a wuss and it scares me, why do I enjoy it? And I do. I, I think I like that adrenaline you know, rush that you get when you know, maybe that the bad guy's yeah. chasing the girl or something. I love that. But yeah, no, no I am a cool wuss. I, I'm terrified the whole time, but I love it. Just terrified. <laughs> There's something very I, perverse about that. I mean, it, it makes. I mean, if it didn't terrify you, then what would be the point? You know, I, mean, I, I, I love horror movies. You know, and I, I'm not easily scared, to be quite honest with you. I, I like the more. I, mean, I love a good slasher film. As, as much as I know, but I like the, the more the, the, the intense, the psychological, um, the creepy ones, and they, they don't seem to make too many of those these days. Probably one of the best ones I've seen recently or recent years was um, it's a great independent movie called Yellow Brick Road. Anybody, if you get the chance to watch it, um, it's, it's all one word, Yellow Brick Road, and it's, it's basically just about a, a bunch of people out, out to film uh, to make a documentary about a. But uh, 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 basically, a bunch of villagers just upped and left the village one day years and years ago, oh, and walked down to yeah. us. And they, they literally follow that, but the atmosphere they build up in the film is just the background music is like the old timey music, and it's very disorienting, and it just gets it eats into your brain, and it is a magnificent film. I, I would recommend it if you want to be creeped out. It's not particularly gory or violent. <laughs> a little bit of that. But if you want to be creeped out and something that will stick in your head for years, Yellow Brick Road, I mean, just 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 get it, find it, watch it. You know, it's um, awesome, awesome film, awesome film. So uh, that's awesome. my point. I definitely I have, will. Yeah, I would. I would just watch it, find it, watch it. But uh, I, I, I really, I, I still, you know, with the odd vein of optimism, I still watch some of the, you know, the, the, the mainstream. I use the word loosely horror films they churn out, and today I've been yeah. disappointed. With you know, well, I think you know. Yeah. I think one of the things that horror does at its best, you know, and this is this is actually a semi-serious answer as opposed to a glib and funny answer, is that I think what horror does is at its best is it allows us to take all the things that we're afraid of in real life and address them in a safe place. Um, you know, horror movies and horror novels that are done well. Um, they, it's a safe way to be scared. And there's a lot of things about sort of being alive that really do truly feel scary and do feel dangerous. Um, and that can be kind of overwhelming. And so it's a place where you know it's okay to be afraid. Um, and yeah. I think you know, sort of the, at, at its best, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think like I said, that's why I think people like like to be scared you know they, it, it, it does it helps you come i mean probably the biggest thing it helps you come from is death i mean it's something that we, we, we you know <laughs> it sort of levels the playing field for everyone you know and it helps you to deal mm-hmm. with that and, um you know all the questions arising from that but um yeah I, 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 a great philosophical answer i think there's obviously a lot in that um and it, it, it's you know something that we as writers certainly as horror writers capitalize on Marvelously. <laughs> as long as people are afraid and want to be afraid and want to be scared in a safe way, then you know we, we're going to make a living, which is <laughs> which is good. But unfortunately, um, we we I, I got the, the nice lady in my head saying we've got sixty seconds left, so we're going to have oh, to gosh. say goodbye. I'm afraid. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and yes, and I'll Absolutely. definitely be hounding you again on Facebook for you to come back. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so give 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 your book another plug. It is called The Hatching by Ezekiel Boone, and you can um, find it anywhere books are sold. And I'm on Twitter at Ezekiel underscore Boone, or you know, shockingly, my website is www.ezekielboone.com. Awesome. There you go. Brilliant. So that is fantastic. Again, thank you. We will have you back on the show again very very soon. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Great. Thanks, Ed. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. That was good. We, 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 we have absolutely no time for a tune at the end, which is fine. You know, great, great guest this evening. Um, always Thank wonderful. So more, really. um, we, uh, that's it. We've gone. So um, we, we can stay and chat if you want. <laughs> we are now... <laughs> 
tell you what I'm going to do. Tell you, just it's just us two now. Um, I'm going to play a tune anyway. <laughs> what would you like? Are, are you in the mood for anything specific? I don't have any I, more Frankie would... Valley, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I tell you what, I, I, I was going to play this at the end because it's one that um, one that I, it reminds me of my childhood. This I remember from being probably my daughter's age, and we used to sing this, and it, it's just a, a great uplift. You listen to the words; it's one of those songs where you listen to the words, and it's depressing as fuck, but the tune <laughs> just lifts your heart. So it, I, I like. The, 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 the contrasting song. I'm going to play this for you, and um, uh, and for me as well, because I it's my birthday this weekend. So. Where's your mama gone? Where's your mama gone? Don't go to Geico.com. Car insurance can be hard. Like early 90s heavy metal hard. I'm yelling and screaming and I'm loud. Roar. Geico makes it easy. You can review and update your policy or report a claim on Geico.com or the Geico mobile app. Because shouldn't we all have a little less stress in our lives? I'm not even upset about anything. 